the saga of Apollo program should begin with a fire in January of 1967 that killed three astronauts, threw the whole program into disarray. And uh, out of that terrible tragedy, I'm convinced came the genesis of Apollo program that was so successful. One of the beauties of, of working for NASA at this time was it wasn't bureaucratic. When I first flew the simulator, I pulled the, the stick back and the nose went down. Pushed the stick forward and the nose went up. I called the North American engineer over and I said, hey, you got the polarity screwed up on this. This is, uh, look, what's happening? He said, oh, that's the way we're going to fly it. I said, what do you mean? I never flown an airplane like this. He said, oh, you're not going to fly the airplane. You're going to fly the target. And so I said, huh? So I, I didn't argue with him. I just went over and called NASA and Houston. I said, look, these idiots have got it all screwed up. And a half an hour later, it was changed. They didn't have a committee. It just was changed. It was wonderful. We were assigned to the third Apollo mission. It was supposed to have been a, a long duration exercising the lunar module and command module on Earth orbit out to 8,000 miles. And then while we were going through the systems for the spacecraft, I got a call from Deke Slayton, who said we've had a change in plans. And he informed me that the CIA had informed NASA that they uh, probably be a Soviet attempt to go around the moon before the end of the year. And they wanted to know if we could change our mission, train, and, and be able to go. I immediately said yes, because I knew that Bill and Jim were dying for the chance to do this. The whole concept of changing our mission was done because we were in that program, the can-do program, beat the Soviets to the moon. So they made some very bold decisions here at NASA. They said if Apollo 7 is successful in its 11-day orbit, then we will change the mission of Apollo 8 and send it to the moon. Young President Kennedy made a commitment for this nation to send man to the moon and back within this decade. The nation was committed, but the engineers and the technicians that gave so much extra time. Werner's making a presentation about some of the work that's being done by his team on Saturn V. And he said, well, no, we have this idea here where we can improve this. Uh, Fritz, you tell him it was your idea. Werner would always make it a team effort, not just Werner thought of it. Now that is a real leader. And when we went through countdown on Apollo 7, I said, I can't believe this is working so perfectly. Boom, we lifted off. We didn't delay our Saturn 1B because of the booster. We delayed because we made a mistake on the spacecraft. We felt like the spacecraft that we were going to fly was such a difference from what had essentially killed, uh, you know, Gus and Roger and Ed. That was the spur that allowed us to make that final decision after Apollo 7 to say, yes, let's go. To put people uh, on the moon with enough fuel uh, to enable them to return safely home to Earth requires a still larger and more powerful rocket, however. And this is what we call the Saturn V. The Saturn V will have a thrust of seven and a half million pounds in the first stage and the takeoff weight of this uh, monstrous rocket will be about 6 million pounds or 3,000 tons, which is about the weight of a light naval cruiser. Apollo was really not a program to explore the moon. It was to beat the Soviets, to demonstrate uh, our technological preeminence. Another battle in the Cold War. 1968 was a very poor year in this country. The Vietnam War was going on. All the young people knew the, the war was a mistake. There were two assassinations. There were riots in the streets. The Democratic Convention had riots there. Yet at the last part of December, we launched something everybody in this country could be proud of. Three men going 240,000 miles all the way to the moon. You know, sometimes you get into a project that you really never quite see the end. You're working hard, you forget about the, the final part, the, the completion. And then it was the day of the launch. We have ignition and you know, it suddenly dawned on me the that this is not another four, orbital flight. Three, this spacecraft three, and this rocket are going to take off and we're zero. headed for the moon. We have commit. We have, off. The we have is running. Off. I literally felt like I was being thrashed around like a rat in the jaws of a carrier. Of course, I was the rookie of the flight. 
but I like to say that everybody was a rookie on the first Saturn V. You see uh, an S1C, the first stage cut off. Well, we made it into orbit. We went around the Earth once and a half, but over Hawaii, uh, Mike Collins said Apollo 8 year go for translunar injection. We lit the S4B, picked up 25,000 miles an hour, and uh, started toward the moon. This flight couldn't have been scripted by a screenwriter any better than it actually came out to be. It was on December 21st. We had orbit the moon on Christmas Eve. I told Michael, you guys are up there, and uh, he said, who's driving? I think Isaac Dutton's doing most of the driving right now. One of the important things on the flight plan was when we would lose communication with the Earth. Because as you go around the moon, the communications would be blanked out. Safe journey, guys. Thanks a lot, Trips. We'll see you on the other side. We went into the shadow of the moon, and it was dark. I got to tell you, the hair went up on the back of my neck. When we popped out of that shadow and relit our engines, we were going to orbit. Bill Anders will always mention that he was the first one to get to the moon because he was in a position whereby he was a few centimeters ahead of us. You know, I mean, first is first. When first we finally came into the uh, sunshine, I think we were best expressed as three school kids looking through a candy store window. Our noses were pressed to the glass. We were just 60 miles above the moon at that time. But well, we were on the third revolution, and I was busy taking pictures of the backside of the moon. And uh, I think Frank yelled out, look, and uh, here was this gorgeous thing coming up over the lunar horizon. I could put my thumb up and completely hide the Earth. Everything I knew was behind my thumb. In fact, it didn't look like there was anybody there, it looked completely inhabited. But I did know that there was five billion astronauts all on this spaceship Earth. We were told that on Christmas Eve we would have the largest audience that ever listened to a human voice. And the only instructions that we got from NASA was to do something appropriate. For all the people back on Earth, the crew of Apollo 8 has a message that we would like to send to you. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered in together into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and from the crew of Apollo 8, we close with good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on this good earth. One of the more exciting parts of the, of the mission from my standpoint was lighting the rocket to get us home. Otherwise, we'd still be there. And we had a, a signal that got down to five seconds before it should be lit. And uh, it said something like, do you really want to make this maneuver? And so I hesitated with my finger and Borman says, push the button, push the button. We lit the rocket for about four or five minutes. We started home. Coming back from the moon is different than the orbital types because you're coming in faster than a circular speed from the moon. And when you get right down to the atmosphere, that's when you're doing your max speed. We're coming back 35,000 feet a second, way over any world speed record that had been set before. As soon as we got down, I knew that we accomplished a successful first flight to the moon, but I didn't know the significance of it. It takes a little bit of history and aging to say, hey, really what happened? As we stepped out on the carrier with that fresh ocean breeze, it was a feeling to me of overwhelming sense of gratitude for what we have been part of. I think that the three of us were very, very fortunate Americans. 400,000 people put that thing together. We suddenly ended that year on a positive note doing something that everybody could take pride in.